Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moffin coming at you with a, another A-Push video. This is taking a look at Topic 8.2, the Cold War. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the Cold War during the Truman Administration in Asia. Uh, previously we talked about how the United States is going to be compelled to initiate the containment policy to stop the spread of communism. We saw that used through the Truman Doctrine in Greece and Turkey. We saw that used with the Marshall Plan. We saw that used with the Berlin Airlift. But now let's take a look at how this is going to be applied in Asia. Now, with the end of World War II, we have to kind of wrap up what's going to be happening with uh, Japan. At the end of Japan, uh, Hideki Tojo and some of the other top military brass that are going to be leading Japan into World War II and will be allowing for you know numerous human rights violations for POWs, you know, including and not limited to uh, the Bataan Death March, will be executed. Uh, the United States will be directing Japan in construction of a new democratic republic that is going to be based on a parliamentary system, kind of similar to Britain's or Canada's, uh, and with a key provision in the new constitution that even though the monarchy will still be allowed to exist, uh, they must admit that, that the Japanese emperor is a human, not a god, and they have to, you know, have a clear limitation of the size of their military. Their military is now basically a glorified police force, which means that Japan is now going to have to become reliant on the United States for its protection moving forward. Uh, moving over to the Philippines, shortly after the war ends, the U.S. will make good on its pre-war uh, promise to grant uh, independence to the Philippines. But note, you know, even though Japan is now going to be, uh, you know, restored and the Philippines will now be independent, they are clearly going to be uh, under the responsibility of the United States for protection, which still exists to this day. The United States still maintains military bases in Japan and the Philippines. So as America is going to be exerting influence in Japan and, and maintaining some degree of uh, influence in the Philippines, things are going to be a little bit different in China. Now, prior to World War II, we had already seen the emergence of a civil war taking place between Chinese nationalist forces led by Chiang Kai-shek over here on the left and communist forces led by Mao Zedong on the right. Uh, now, that vicious civil war will go on hiatus as both of these factions are going to have a common enemy in the invading Japanese during the war. But everybody knows that once the Japanese are defeated, control, fight for the, the fight for control over China will be renewed. And that is exactly what will happen. Uh, in the end, Mao's communist forces will be successful in defeating the nationalist forces, whoopsie, the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, what will basically happen over the course of the late 1940s, as you can see here from this map, coming in from Manchuria, the northeast of China, and moving southwestward, Mao's forces will be pushing uh, the nationalist forces further and further south, and then eventually those forces will run away to the island of Taiwan. Uh, basically surrendering the rest of China to uh, the communists. Now, here's what's going to be interesting. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek is not going to, uh, you know, basically give away what he considers to be his title as the leader of China. So the nationalist forces in Taiwan are still going to be operating uh, under the assumption that they are still the legitimate government of China, even though they have no power and influence outside of the island of Taiwan. But here's what's really interesting. Not only will Chiang uh, assert this, so will the United States. Uh, remember, you know, the United States is not going to do anything that's going to help to promote communism. And even though it's, clearly to, it's clear to anybody that the communists have taken over mainland China, the U.S. will still, for several decades, uh, continue to recognize Taiwan as the official government of China. Now, even though we're still going to be making that statement, the reality is we've lost China to communism. And there's going to be tremendous political ramifications for that. Uh, you know, Truman, President Truman, is going to catch a lot of heat, a lot of flack 
over the idea that he was ultimately responsible for letting this happen. Remember, containment is about stopping the spread of communism. And we were unable to apply that to the largest country in the world in terms of population. Now, some you know would argue that the United States really couldn't send troops in, really couldn't do anything there because of China's proximity to the Soviet Union and there was already a pre-existing communist force there. But still, Truman's going to catch a lot of blame for this. And this is going to be significant because never again is Truman going to get caught looking soft on communism in Asia. And this is going to be very significant as we move into the peninsula of Korea. Now, following the end of World War II, we are going to be seeing a divided Korea. Uh, if you take a look up here, uh, you're going to be seeing that uh, following the end of World War II, right along, you know, basically the 38th parallel, there will be two Koreas. The northern part of Korea that was liberated by Chinese and Russian forces and southern part of Korea, which is going to be liberated by American forces. Now, when the war ends, this northern portion that was liberated by the communists will be installing uh, a man by the name of Kim Il-sung, and that's him on the right, Kim Il-sung. And yes, this is the grandfather of the current North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un. And yes, there is quite a remarkable resemblance. Uh, the southern half, liberated by American forces, will become a democratic uh, nation led by Syngman Rhee over here on the left. So you now have at the end of World War II, two Koreas. The Kim family running North Korea in a communist government, Syngman Rhee leading it in a democratic republic in the south. Now note, there had never been two Koreas before, and there was no notion that you know, that would stay that way forever, uh, especially coming from the Kim family. So the idea being is that, you know, having two Koreas is preposterous and the Kims are going to uh, move on trying to uh, unify all Koreans on the peninsula. And this will lead in the summer of 1950 to North Korea invading the South. If you take a look at this first map here on the left, you're going to see that North Korean forces are going to push very quickly down the peninsula. South Korean forces are going to get pummeled. Uh, and you can see here, South Korean forces are on the verge of surrender, uh, pretty much holding out at the uh, southeastern port city of Pusan. So things look really, really bad right out the get-go. But note, the United States, led by Truman, is not going to let another Asian country fall to communism. But note, the U.S. doesn't want to look like a cowboy going in there unilaterally. So we're going to see the United States utilize the United Nations for the first time to create a U.N. fighting force to defend South Korea's independence. Now, even though this is going to be a U.N. force, let's be honest, this is going to be made up mostly of American soldiers and led by American general, the, the general that won the Pacific Theater in World War II, Douglas MacArthur. And when we see MacArthur uh, come to Korea, things are going to change and change in a big way. Uh, almost overnight, we're going to see American, UN, and South Korean forces turn the tide against the North Korean communists. As you can see, within a matter of weeks, they are pushing way back up north. And not only will they reclaim South Korea, now MacArthur feels, hey, we've got the communists on the run. Once again, there is no such thing as two Koreas. So the plan is to keep going and basically let's liberate all of Korea. Now that might sound good in a, in a very theoretical sense or looking at a map that looks nice or whatever, but there's going to be a lot of potential problems with American forces pushing further and further north and the North Koreans, you know, running away very quickly. Uh, but nonetheless, by the end of the summer in 1950, things look really good for uh, the United States. And, I'm sorry, by the, by the beginning of the, of the excuse me, by mid-autumn, things are looking really good for the United States. But here's where things get complicated. Douglas MacArthur is a military guy. He's not a politician. And, and Truman has to think about the big picture of things. He knows that as MacArthur's forces are moving northward and northward at a pretty rapid rate, 
that it's getting closer and closer to the Yalu River, which, of course, the Yalu River is the border between North Korea and China, which had just recently been taken over by the communists. So, as you can imagine, these folks in China, led by Mao, are going to be a little bit nervous, a little bit, you know, paranoid about what the U.S. is doing in Korea as they get closer and closer to the Yalu River. Uh, Truman tries to cool the jets of MacArthur, but doesn't really work very well. And before, you know, you know it, uh, the Chinese are going to enter into the conflict. So understand, we go from North Korea clearly winning the war to American and UN forces clearly winning the war, but then it changes once again. So in November of 1950, we start to see hundreds of thousands of Chinese communist soldiers pour across the border. And this will change things in a very big way. Uh, the United States was not that prepared for this kind of a fighting force. And as you can see, the, uh, the North Koreans and the Chinese are going to be pushing American forces back pretty fast now in the other direction. So as you can see, this war in many respects is kind of a race up and down the Korean Peninsula. But once again, they are pushed south of the major city of Seoul. And by the time we get into late 1950, early 1951, once the Chinese enter it, it's pretty clear what this war is. I mean, it's called the Korean War appropriately because it is taking place on the peninsula of Korea. But you could also call this the Sino-American War because the vast majority of soldiers fighting this are the Chinese versus the Americans. Uh, the Koreans are just, you know, uh, the folks in the middle, so to speak. And as Americans are now on the retreat, MacArthur is getting very, very nervous about, you know, what to do next. And remember, MacArthur does not like the idea of losing. This is a guy that, you know, won for the Allies in World War II. So MacArthur's plan, once they're on in, in retreat, is to take things to the next level. MacArthur, seeing how we ended the war in World War II, is going to be advocating for the use of detonating anywhere from three to seven atomic bombs on numerous Chinese cities to win the war. Now, note, you're talking about nuclear weapons, which we've only used once before. And, of course, think of the ramifications of this. The Soviet Union now has nuclear weapons as well. It's not like 1945 when we're the only ones that had it. So Truman tells MacArthur, no, you can't do this. Uh, you are not allowed. This is a limited war. Our specific goal is to liberate South Korea. That's your job. It's not to bomb China. So MacArthur doesn't do it, but MacArthur is very good at giving orders and not so good at taking orders. And he will basically begin a public uh, campaign in the media criticizing President Truman due to his refusal to use nuclear weapons, and basically painting Truman as being soft on communism and not willing to do what it takes to win the war. Well, I don't know about you, but if you are publicly bashing your boss in the media, you're probably not going to have that job for very long. And Truman's going to have to make the tough decision to ultimately fire MacArthur. Now note, when you fire MacArthur, it's not just some general... He's the most beloved general in America at this time. He is a hero from World War II. And even though, you know, Truman, you can look back and say, did the right thing and using nukes was the, the sounder option, most Americans did not agree at the time. His popularity will plummet. In fact, New York City will have a ticker tape parade for MacArthur. And Congress will, inv will uh, invite MacArthur to speak. Truman's popularity drops to less than 30%. Remarkable. And it will basically cost him any desire of running for another term. In the meanwhile, as we get to 1951, you're going to see Americans start to push back a little bit, but a really deadly stalemate ensues starting in early 1951 that doesn't really move for the next two years. Ultimately, Truman will not run again, and Eisenhower, the former Allied Supreme Commander in World War II, will win, and he wins in part with a promise, if elected, to go to Korea to settle the conflict once and for all, which he does and he settles it with an armistice with the Chinese and the North Koreans, uh, creating what is now still the border along the 38th parallel. Understand that this is still an armistice. No treaty has ever been agreed upon, so it's still technically a very dangerous, tense situation, 
Uh, but it does come to an end in terms of active fighting with over 35,000.